All right, all right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started um, so people find their seats. Um, thanks for coming. I'm glad to see some ladies in here. I wish there were a few more. Even though this is going to be geared a little more towards pastors and elders, I'm going to really make an effort for this to be applicable to anybody who is in any form of leadership in the church, okay? So um, if somebody you know might be blessed by this, you can share some of the notes, or I'm actually going to give you a, a place you can go from here to take a leadership health assessment for those of you who want to take that, and that might be helpful to some other people. Um, I think we'd all agree that um, we don't want just leaders, but we want healthy leaders, right? And healthy leaders build healthier churches. Amen? I've come from some situations over the last 30 years where there's been a lack of focus on health. Uh, that's, I've seen what that can do. I've also been in places where health is more focused on or where uh, a deeper uh, soul uh, care and self-care focus has been, and, I, and I've seen those to be very, very effective. In Scripture, one place I was just thinking about as I walked up, and I thought, yeah, I think I'll mention this in 1 Timothy 4. Obviously, Paul's admonishing Timothy. He's telling him to keep up the good work, not to be, you know, uh, judged for his youth, but to, to, to just keep going. Um, and be trained in righteousness, and, and, and to keep his godliness in front of him. And in verse 16, he says, Keep watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And I, and I think that that's a good reminder. It's not just keep it, watch on your theology, but keep watch on your life being congruent with your theology. Sometimes I talk about uh, uh, what I would call the integrity gap. The integrity gap would be my spoken theology and my lived theology. How far apart are they? Are you living out your faith? Are you modeling what you believe most? So this is part of what we'll be talking about in this time um, about healthy leaders contributing to a healthy plurality. Um, and I'm, when I think of leader health, there's a lot of things that could come into play. But I, I want you to think specifically about these three things. Um, spiritual health, emotional health, and relational health. Okay, spiritual, emotional, relational Okay, you could think of physical health, you could think of mental health, though it's kind of captured already in those others. You could think of other ways to get healthy family habits in place. Again, that would fit under relationship. But spiritual, emotional, relational, if you have um, a, a sense of how you're doing in those three areas and you're working on a plan to keep those healthy, uh, you're ahead of the curve of most leaders. Okay, uh, Dave Harvey, who we've heard today in a couple of plenaries, uh, the president of GCC, I'm on staff, I oversee the pastoral care uh, of the GCC pastors and wives and um, just try to help as much as I can to make sure that they're taking care of themselves and working well with their elders and teams as well as doing some soul care things. But Dave, Dave says this in a book that's about to be published on healthy pluralities. The quality of our plurality determines the health of the church. The quality of our plurality determines the health of the church. God meant for leadership to be shared in the church. Amen? Doesn't mean that there might be somebody who's the lead pastor or is more competent in an area and you would defer to that person's skill or experience, but it's shared in terms of authority, particularly at the elder level, and that is extremely important for health. So 
plurality typically refers to pastors and elders in the church, but you could, and even church polity, but you could think team, you could think cohorts, collaboration, uh, ways that you can work with other people uh, that, that uh, would also capture this idea of a plural leadership. So I agree, Health, healthy leaders um, build, encourage, strengthen healthy churches. It really trickles down. But what constitutes health? So I want to talk about five habits and five obstacles to healthy leadership. What habits demonstrate healthy leadership? What obstacles exist that uh, we need to avoid or overcome so that we can have healthy leadership? And there's a couple of books that have had a shaping influence on my thoughts on this. There's probably seven or eight, but these two I brought because I th think they've probably had some of the most. One is called Resilient Ministry, and it's uh, what pastors told us about surviving and thriving in ministry. It's like a seven-year longitudinal study, uh, a lot of interviewing, a lot of uh, going through life together with pastors and wives and coming up with some really cool uh, conclusions. So uh, Resilient Ministry, if you, if you just Google that, you'll uh, be able to get that off Amazon if you want it. And then, what's that? Who's, it's three authors, Bob Burns, Tasha Chapman, and Donald Guthrie. So Burns, Chapman, and Guthrie. Um, you can come up and look at it after if you want. And then Your Life in Rhythm by Bruce Miller. Less stress, more peace. Less frustration, more fulfillment. Less discouragement, more hope. Sounds pretty good. Um, I'll talk about why I think rhythms are important here in a minute. So, um, but anyway, from this, what I've done is spent some time putting together an assessment, which I'll talk about at the end of our time, with five key leadership health indicators that will help you assess where am I in terms of emotional, relational, spiritual health, okay? And I think that could be helpful to you going forward to make a plan if you don't have one already. Okay, some of the goals. As you listen to this, again, you have some notes in front of you, but just jot down some things personal to you as a leader, or maybe your team, or your elder board, or your staff. I want you to think about your church, your ministry, your team, so when you walk out of here, you begin to know what next steps might be in getting even more health in your organization, your leadership. Okay, I want you to anticipate and avoid unhealthy patterns and obstacles, develop healthy leadership rhythms, and then accurately be able to assess the health of your plurality at any time. Okay? If you could do that, you're going to be in a really good place to make adjustments as you go. So are you ready for five common mistakes that could really negatively impact your leadership culture? Okay. Some of you are. Then I'll go ahead. In consulting with pastors and elders around the world over the last several years and working in churches for 20-some years, I've been in, I was an elder since, let's see, when did I get? The first time I became an elder was 1999, okay, uh, at College Park Church in Indianapolis. And, and uh, I've been under really excellent Bible teaching all through my church career, not always under excellent leadership, but uh, excellent Bible teaching, and, um, and then watching, wait a minute, why is there a disconnect between what the Bible has to say about eldership and leadership and excellent Bible teaching, right? It, it's almost like, why is there a psychology department in a lot of seminaries? I, anyway, it's another, another conversation. Um, so here's what I would just say, it doesn't have to be that way, but we got to close the gap. 
Okay, so here, here's number one. Get the wrong leaders on the bus. Be in a hurry and just grab leaders based on things like uh, their competence in their workplace or their capacity to serve or your desperateness to get a warm body, uh, whatever it might be. But get the wrong leaders on the bus and you are, you've, you're already ready for a roller coaster ride, right? Okay. Um, what will happen is you potentially uh, can have divisiveness. Anybody relate to that? Okay. Yeah, I got, you know, it's that one guy. I wish I just wouldn't, I would have been a little more careful or gosh, I, you know, you know, I, you can't, you know, you can't make up for that mistake very easily, right? Doesn't it cost you quite a bit when you get the wrong guy on the bus or the wrong gal on the bus? Um, disillusionment, um, even potentially uh, church, uh, it can be disastrous. Better to vet them thoroughly, uh, candidate them, apprentice them. That's one of the best things you can do is to put them in, underneath a quality leader over time and see how they do and and see how they learn, and see if they're teachable, and see where their strengths and weaknesses are, and get to know their marriage, or family, or personal life. Check character references, and then more character references. Not just competency, but character. Okay. Um, what's a principle that you guys probably already thinking of? First Timothy, right? Uh, bring a deacon up because they're a nice guy and they got a lot of capacity. Don't worry about their character or don't test them. Is that what it says in 1 Peter 3? I don't think so. It says to, that they need to be tested first, right? So what does that look like? Have they um, been tested uh, already in leadership in some way, maybe small group leadership or some, uh, serving somewhere in the church and people, they have a good reputation. You've seen them around their family. You've seen them under pressure. You see them loving the word of God and loving people well. Test it. So um, recruit and evaluate leadership based on worldly standards. You're going to get the wrong person on the bus, okay? It's easy to do sometimes because uh, somebody may have a lot of charisma, but you don't know their character. Uh, somebody uh, may be, have a lot of success at work or have a great reputation in the marketplace, and you promote them based on just competence. Or they're driven and they're decisive and they just seem like a leader and you need a little bit more leadership. Maybe even you need to compensate for some guys that just aren't pulling their weight. So you put them in there because they have a strong personality, but you don't know if they can shepherd at all or they have good people skills. Really two principles here, character first and secondly, servant leader. Okay, character first. And are they a servant leader? Okay, so if you have those two things, well, we've really done a good job. We understand the character of this person. They understand they're not perfect, but they're, but they're qualified in leading well, it, depending on the position you're putting them in. And they're a servant leader. They're not a cowboy Christian. You know, they, 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 don't, hurt, you know, they don't herd people. Uh, they lead people. Okay? Number two. Uh, succumb to unrealistic, unrealistic expectations and people pleasing. You want to, uh, you know, tank your health as a leader or tank the plurality. Um, be at the beck and call of everybody and anybody that has a preference in your church. Fear of man. What? It'll prove to be what? A snare, right? Uh, trusting the Lord will keep you safe. Proverbs twenty nine twenty five. So um, I think of it, you, you may have slightly different um, polity or governance in your church, but I think the, the, the churches I've seen do, do this well have their elder governed, their staff led, and they're congregationally informed. Okay? They're elder governed, 
And they, the elders are on the mission, man, and they're keeping alignment to the mission, and they're about the gospel, and they're, they're, they're very much about helping uh, the staff succeed at, uh, at executing the mission, but the staff are about executing, and the staff are about leading the church under the elders' governance, and then they don't make huge decisions without informing the congregation and getting a feel for whether that is in line with the spirit of the church. They're not really asking permission. It's not a voting thing. It's a unity thing. Does that make sense? That is seemingly what I've seen to be the healthiest interaction between leaders and their people. But whatever your case is, be clear biblically about how you set that up and do not walk into the minefield of preference or people yanking you around with different agendas um, and all of a sudden dividing elders and talking about the pastor and do not let that happen. You got to shut that down lovingly. Obviously, we, we, we you know, we're, when we lead, we, we lead, uh, you know, uh, gently, but we lead firmly, okay, as leaders. And we're not going to tolerate uh, that. We're not going to fall into uh, trying to fulfill unrealistic expectations or uh, pe- trying to please people instead of God, okay? That's number two. Leader health means learning how to say no for the better yes. I have no problem saying no now compared to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was, yep, yep, got it, do it, got it, will, yep. Uh, you know, and that was wearing me out, right? Um, but I learned that God's like, I don't need you to say yes all the time. I need you to say yes to what's important. Yes to what I have put on your heart. Yes to what others around you who are wise and discerning are saying needs to get done not what everybody needs done or thinks they need done. So learn to say no for the better yes. It's kind of like Martha and Mary a little bit, right? Mary said, no, I'm not going to help you set the table right now because the main dish just came in the room. (laughs) You know, like I'm at the feet of the one who I is here, we're here to honor, and I want to spend every minute possible with him, I don't think he's worried about whether the napkins are on the table. You know, so, you know, you got to know when a better yes is there and to be, and not fear saying no. Are you yanked around by people's complaints, preferences, crises? Study how Jesus responded to these things. That will help you. Are you always on? Man, I am on. I am, hey, listen, pastor 24-7. You know, phone's right here. I, I sleep with my phone next to my bed table. I, you know, I don't miss a thing. Why don't you ask your wife how that's going, or your husband if you're a lady leader, and, you know, how's that going? How's that going for the kids? How's that going for your health? How's that going for the sustainability of your church? Have you not learned how to give away leadership? Have you not learned to shut your phone down certain times? Um, You need to have some margin and rhythms. Get back to your identity in the gospel, not in your job. Okay. Leaving conflict, number three, unresolved and neglect your marriage relationship. That's going to go well. Um, here's an obstacle that's common across every single network we've talked to. N- name a major church planting network, and this is a problem in their network. They, that we're, not, we're having conflict issues, and they're not being resolved biblically. We have particular issues at home, marriage conflict, family conflict, and it's not being handled well. Like, really? Everywhere? All over? Conflict poorly addressed or unresolved in personal life, let alone the church. And our leaders are too busy or too distracted to nurture their own marriage and family. Uh, 
that to me is something we need to get after. We need to get after it with intention. We need to get after it with immediacy. Uh, we need to take care of our family life. And we need to be able to resolve conflict biblically. If you're wondering where you could do a study on that, just look at James 4 sometime, and you'll see some really good principles there. Okay. Um, and I'll just share with you a couple things about conflict resolution. There's really three kinds of leaders. There's... Um, Peace fakers, they're, they're conflict avoidant. They sweep it under the rug. They just don't like conflict. Why are you a pastor? Um, uh, you know what I mean? Seriously, you just signed up for conflict, okay? Um, um, then, there's con then there's peace breakers, peace fakers, peace breakers. You want some of this? You want some of this. You know what I mean? They're just like almost looking for it. And they, they blow stuff up all the time just so they can say they did. I don't really understand it. But they, they're, they're, they, you know, this guy's over here clamming up, covering up, smoothing over. And this guy is like, you know, every time anybody questions him or her, they, they're, they're, they're either passive aggressive or, or outwardly aggressive, and they're just destroying relationships. But then there's God's man or God's woman in leadership, a peacemaker. Here's what, uh, you know, Ken Sandy said to me a long time ago, back college park days, probably about 1999 or 2000, I was hanging out with him and we had this great talk about the conflict uh, culture at College Park. And one of the things he said is, Gary, you, you got to start seeing conflict as an assignment. It's inevitable and it's an assignment to respond biblically under pressure. You've got to start thinking it's going to happen. It's how I handle it that matters. Not avoid it, not create it, not just... No, it's coming, right? It's coming and handle it biblically. Learn how to handle. Don't, 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 don't avoid it. Don't look for it, but be ready for it, right? And I think that was very instructive and very helpful to be, uh, in fact, a peacemaker who sees conflict as an assignment to, and solves it with Scripture, and here's another thing I've, I've found um, that uh, in your leadership, when you come to lead at the church, you have to ask yourself, how am I leading at home? Because if you're just coming home with your leftovers because, and, and you were leading all day long at the church and poured yourself out, and I, how can my spouse expect me to have you know, anything wonderful for her or the kids. I mean, don't they know what I do? That is dangerous. I literally have had to pull over on the, from the way to work to home for a couple of reasons. One, I'm just exhausted. I don't even want to go home because I know that everyone's going to want something. You ever had that feeling? And you just feel like, I'm just going to fail? Or... I'm, I sense that I have a feeling, I just got done having six people do exactly what I told them to do, and it was like awesome, and I'm tempted to do that when I get home, and I'm like, better pull over and, and right-size yourself, because you're about to go home to serve your wife. You're going home to go to work, right? You can't go home to be served, right? And so just that change of mentality and then when I am home, hi, my name's Garrett, and I have a cell phone. Um, and, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. When I get home, my phone's going, and I start working at home. My wife says, you're here, but you're not here. Be 100% present at home. Have dinner around a table. No phone zone, Right? Do what you have to do because you are the discipler of your home. You are the one to wash your wife in the word, and you are the main discipler of your kids. 
No one else can do it like you. No one will do it better or worse than you. Like you'll have, because you have so much impact. Does that make sense? So don't tell me you're, you know, like I, I get that there's some, it's easier sometimes to lead in the church than it is at home. I get that. I do. But you can't make a disparate thing between the two. Home is ministry. Church is ministry. God's not evaluating you just on how you do at church. Okay. Two more. Number four, avoid feedback. This is something you shouldn't do. Avoid feedback and ignore strained work relationships. Listen, it's been my experience over and over again that leaders in the church sacrifice self-awareness for speed. Notice I slowed down a little bit. <laughs> Think about that for just a second. How self-aware are you? How, how good your EQ, your emotional intelligence? I hate to tell you guys, but if I did a survey of a thousand pastors, um, you know, I don't think that, that the average EQ would be that high. Okay? And then there's cultural awareness, too. What's going on around me? Am I con able to contextualize and adapt to the situation I'm in? Those are important things. And so if you're running hard or stressed out of your mind or whatever it is that would make it really hard to be able to slow down and be self-aware, go take a three-day Sabbath retreat. I've got a thing online if you guys really want it. It's Garrett at gccollective.org. Uh, I will send you a guided three-day Sabbath plan that will rock your world, okay? And you will come back like, okay, baby, we need to talk. <laughs> that's, you, that's hopefully not you and your elders. Uh, you, um, that's you and your wife or husband or whatever. And then you uh, get after it and you make some changes and get some rhythms going, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, don't be beyond feedback. You know how you can kind of get to the point where, you know, it's not that I don't like feedback. It's just that people judge me or I'm, I feel like I'm a glass house already. I get enough criticism, so I don't want to hear it anymore, right? You know how we get like that as, as pastors or leaders? Don't do that to yourself. Like, go take one of your staff or your elders out. Hey, how am I doing? How are we doing? What do you think we could grow in? Where do you see the gaps? Seek feedback and listen to it. Take notes. They'll appreciate just that you ask their opinion. You don't have to make every suggested change, but seek feedback. Don't be above it. Don't be so defensive because maybe you've gotten a lot of negative uh, feedback from certain people or you just don't know if you can trust somebody, and put it with a grain of salt. There's going to be people, you're, you know, feedback's not going to be as helpful as others, but people that love you or that are life-giving or care about your church, listen to them. Okay, so if you want to create a false ceiling in the plurality health of your church, be unteachable, be unapproachable. You know, Proverbs 18.1 talks about uh, you know, a man who isolates himself, he, 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 he basically starts only listening to himself and he rears up against all other advice or judgment. <laughs> Don't, listen, do you know that there's somewhere, some statistic between seven to nine uh, times out of ten, a pastor doesn't have a confidant in their life? So somewhere between 70 to 90% of pastors don't have a confidant. They may have some allies, but a confidant is somebody that you just like, they know everything, and you know a lot about them, and you are doing life with them at a level of transparency that there's true accountability. Also, don't be the, the expert in the room every time, okay? 
If, if you're the expert in the room every time you're in a meeting, that's a problem as a leader. And you probably don't either, either you don't have the right people around you or you just don't respect the people enough around you. Okay? And don't blame all the leadership issues on that other guy or that other woman or this, this, this couple or that you know, crazy sheep or whatever. If you've got a bunch of conflict going on and you're involved in it, you might want to look at the common denominator and see if you have any part in that, okay? Um, so I would just encourage you, go humble, First Peter 5, 6, and 7. Listen, there's two schools, do you know? You do know this, don't you? you don't, there, listen, I want to send you to the right school. There's two schools. There's the school of humiliation. Oh, it's painful. Been there, done that. Out of my own pride or insecurity, I've gone to that school. I've been forced to go to that school. Okay? Or there's the school of humility. Humble yourself. And in due time, God will exalt you, lift you up. You know, cast your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Go to the school of humility, which means you're self-imposing humility. Like, am I... Is my heart right going into this meeting? Am I ready to acknowledge other people? Am I, whatever it is for humility. Or you will go to humiliation, and it's, it's that, it's that uh, Hebrews 12 kind of thing. You get spanked because God loves you. But, uh, man, I, I'll take grace any day over here. Uh, you get, what He's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the... Humble. So I'm going for more grace, because, which means I have to be more humble. Because I like grace. I do not like um, being opposed. God being opposed to me is not a good day in my life. And you going, what's wrong with him? You know, like, why, does he, why isn't he learning? You know, that's not a good day for me. Finally, leadership development. Don't expect leadership development to happen organically. Okay, hey, you know, yeah, maybe if we just kind of sprinkle some leadership dust on them or they hang out at the hunting retreat, that's going to elevate them, and now they're going to be an awesome leader. Trust me, that ain't happening, okay? Um, leaders need ongoing training, care, counsel, and accountability. Do you hear that? Leaders need ongoing training, care, counsel. <gasps> leaders need counsel. And accountability. And they desperately need it. Matter of fact, in some ways you need it more than the people you're leading. But we don't tend to think that way. You tend to think, well, who's going to really be able to lead me? You know, like, um, I'm already such a leader who, you know, there's, it's hard to find those guys. I mean, most of them are writing books about leadership. You know, uh, you're not that great, uh, first of all. Second of all, uh, there's somebody that's like better at you at this, and you're better at them at this, and you can help each other. Let them lead you here, you lead them here. Um, you know, get a leadership coach. Um, all those things would be really important. Think of Paul and Timothy. You know, there was a Barnabas, but there was a Timothy. There's, you, you, do you have a Paul? Do you have some Barnabases in your life? And do you have some Timothys? I hope, I'm betting most of you have Timothys. And maybe a, maybe a Barnabas, but, you know, they can, you know, sometimes let you down, but they're still there to encourage you. And, but the Paul thing, who's your Paul? Leaders need that. They need a development plan and path, okay? Someone may have all the potential in the world to lead, but you don't coach them up. You don't. You let them, you just send them out. And when you send them out, they often burn out, rust out, step out of ministry. And you're like, well, that guy was an awesome volunteer. And now he doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> Guys, you didn't do anything with him. You didn't pour. I, hey, man, I see so much potential in you. I feel like God's got his hand on you. I want, you're like, dang, man, I'll walk through a wall for you. And then next thing you know, you can't even get me on the phone. We don't even talk. You're like, dang, way to use me. Thank you. Um, you know what I'm saying? It probably has happened to you. Okay, it's probably happened to you. Men, especially men. 
take some time with the best leaders in your church. The crazy sheep will be okay. Let them go wander a little bit. You can, you can send those guys after them after you pour into them. Like, hey guys, I just love you so much. There's a couple of crazy sheep over there. Can you guys handle that later? But right now, I just want to pour into you. Do you know that there's statistics out there that um, only about 10 to 15 percent of pastors end well and retires pastors? Because no one was really coaching them. Nobody was pouring into them. They, were, they didn't have a development plan. They didn't have deep care and counsel. All right, you guys ready for some good news after all that? That was all to get you ready to listen to the five health indicators, okay? And here's what, I'm going to warn you, this next section you're going to be like, oh, that's really good. That's cool. I'll have to try to remember that someday. Or, um, yeah, Garrett, I kind of already knew that. I want you to be thinking not about the obviousness of these indicators, but are you doing these things? How, what are the implications of this information? Okay? All right. So, uh, five indicators. And I'm going to talk about rhythms. I told you about this book. Um, here, can I bust a myth right now? There is no such thing as ministry and home balance. Okay? Drop the balls. Just drop all of them. All those balls you're juggling, just drop them right now. Put them on the floor. Say, you spin in plates, you can drop those too. Um, I got to figure out how to have rhythms. Rhythms like work and rest. Like giving and taking care, right? Um, things that are in and out, like a sine wave. Uh, teaching, but learning. Um, care and being cared for, Right? Those kinds of things. Are there rhythms in your life? These things are repeatable, and they come and they go. Um, it could be uh, your Sabbath once a week is a rhythm, right? Amen? Everybody here have a rhythm with Sabbath days? Like one day a week, phone's off. It's an other day. It's a day like no other. That's your Sabbath day. It's towards the Lord, towards your family, and nothing gets in the way right? Uh, you got, uh, trust me, you, you probably have some rhythms. Some are healthy and some are unhealthy. You need to identify them and adjust them biblically. So that's a, so let's just bust the myth of balance. Does anybody here have the perfect balance of ministry and marriage? Because I'd like you to do a workshop later. Uh, no, there's no such thing. There is no perfect balance there's, there's no way. So, you, so the rhythms really break that down. You will wear yourself out trying to find balance. You'll be in a compensatory pattern the rest of your life, and it will exhaust you. Okay, so number one, pursuing ongoing spiritual development. The, the, probably why it's number one for me is because I think it's the most important rhythm and health indicator of the five. Okay? Pursuing ongoing spiritual development. Remember, character first. Are you actively growing as a disciple of Christ? But I'm a leader, you know. I was a disciple before, but now I'm a leader. Are you actively growing as a disciple of Christ? Are you pursuing Christ's likeness as a person? Listen, you're a person before you're a pastor. You're a sheep before you're a shepherd. And that never changes. Your people don't always get that, but you know it's true. And as you teach and, and minister out of your weakness, they'll get it more. <laughs> like, man, I used to be impressed by you. Now I just like you. Um, um, right? I'm like, I'll take the like me thing. I don't need you to be impressed by me anymore. Now I feel like you get me and like we can do life together and I still have a respect for what you know, but I, I feel like you're human. Oh man, I'm so human, it's ridiculous, right? You don't even know. 
Um, remember, in before through, in before through, in Christ in you before through you. And if he ain't in you, if you haven't been abiding, if you're not spending time in the word for your personal nourishment, instead for teaching or equipping or training or rebuking or, yeah, all that's great. But that can't be the first reason you go to the well. Are you dry? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? It's because God, God's been calling you, and you've been running past him saying, just a minute, i got more to do for you. He's like, come here. I know you're weary. I know you're heavy laden. I want to give you rest. And it isn't just any rest, because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, and you've got a yoke on you that I didn't even put on you. And take it off and get some soul rest. And I'm the only place you're going to get it. It is not a vacation. It is a whole different thing, and and it's only going to come from sitting at my feet and abiding in me, crawling up in my lap if you have to, and just crying if you need to, writing a psalm if you need to, journaling, uh, spending just a day by yourself and just (sighs) breathing, pursuing ongoing spiritual development daily, intentionally, deeply. Okay, so what's that look like? Leaders often get into the Word like, I'm in the Word all the time, aren't you, pretty much? Like, I mean, it's what we do. But, but I had to train myself, disciplines, right? I had to discipline myself to get in the Word for me. Isn't that silly? But it's true. I had to discipline myself to meet God in the Word for me first. Because I love to teach, and I love to counsel, and I love to know the Word, and I love to memorize the Word, and all that's great. But if I'm not meditating on it, uh, here, here's what I do. I have this weird thing called my map. So I meditate on the Word to, a, to, to actually apply the Word. Then I go on into memorizing what I, what I, what I just got out of it, because it's so good. I've got, I'm at that address. I'm going to memorize it so that I can keep using it. Okay, then I yield to it in the way I live right? And then I practice it over and over and over again. And then I know I have it. I have that truth and it's changed me. It's transformed me. And so whatever works for you, uh, it's a slow process for me. I'm a little slow. It might, I might stay at the same address for a month in one area of scripture until it actually changes me. But that's what I'm talking about. Something like that. Okay. Um, Getting the word for your own soul food, right? How, how many of you would skip two or three meals in a day unless you're fasting? How many would just not, yeah, I don't, yeah, I just didn't remember to eat today. <laughs> I'd be shocked at most of you if you said that, right? I just forgot to eat today. I don't know, you know, I'm getting, put my head on the pillow. I forgot to eat, you know, it's just unlikely, okay? But what about, I forgot to get into the word for my own soul today. Oh my gosh, how many days can I do that before I'm, I'm a spiritual anorexic trying to pour out for everyone else and starving my own soul? I'm saying that because I love you guys, not to condemn you. And I've been there. Pray personally. Don't just pray for... Intercession is wonderful. I love to intercede for other people. Do it regularly. But I got to pray for me. I got to pray with Tammy. Hey, extra credit for you. Grab your spouse and at least three times a week go on a prayer walk. Changed my marriage. It took me 20 years almost to figure this out. <laughs> I am so stupid. You know, I, I literally would pray with her here and there sporadically. Now it's like we go, we grab hands, we walk and pray, and, it's, and I'm sharing stuff I would have never shared with her before. And she's like, why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't I know this burden? I said, I don't know. I, until I could tell God, I don't think I could tell you. 
you know, and, and now that you and God have heard it and then you prayed over me, I like feel better already, you know, and I feel closer to you too. And, and she's like, I can handle these burdens when we handle, take them to the Lord. Like, you know how you protect your wife or your husband sometimes from ministry because it's so stupid, um, you know, you, or, or just crazy or dramatic or there's just stuff that you just, you don't want to give them confidential information. That's what I'm saying. But not what I'm saying, but it is, but you do want to share your soul burdens with your closest friend or spouse in a way that you can take it to God together. I'm telling you, do it. And listen, accountability, if you don't have accountability in your life and you're a leader, you're exposed. Satan knows it. He's got your number. If you have accountability, it's only as good as how much you trust your accountability partner. So push into, like, dude, are you trustworthy? Like, can we really talk about some hard things? Because I'm a mess. And if you can't handle my mess, it's okay. I love you, and we can be friends. But I can't ask you to be my accountability partner if you're not ready for some... some I'm going to go into the deep end sometimes, because I, I, I... This stuff is messing with me. Like, ministry is hard. And I need you not to be like, whoa, dude, man, really? Like, you know, like, I need you to be like, okay, I don't, I don't fully understand that, but, I, but I'm willing to walk through with you and pray with you and so on and so forth. And I know you got to be careful who you pick as confidants, but that's what I'm talking about. Pick, you know, that Proverbs 17, 17, you know, you know, a friend that loves at all times, brother born for adversity. That's what I'm talking about. And they're not, all, not growing on trees, but they're out there. Okay? Okay, sorry, i got to hustle through this. Here's number two. Number two, practice self-care and healthy boundaries. What? Um, that seems pretty much like a no-brainer, Garrett. Are you kidding, self-care? Oh, yeah, how you doing? Tell me, who do you counsel most? Yourself. How's that going? What's your self-talk? How are you caring for your soul? Are you, um, listen, don't see self-care as selfish. See it as stewardship. See it as I could either run a sprint right now or I could run a marathon for 30 or 40 years. See it as um, I could be all about like pouring myself out, you know, so that I don't rust out or I could be about sustainability and succession. What do I mean by self-care? Rhythms of self-care, okay? Um, for instance, uh, I exercise, believe it or not, um, on a semi-regular basis. That's some self-care. But I also spend time um, with my family and try to shut my s cell phone down. I also spend time with God. And if I feel like I'm really distant from God, I'll stop, take half a day and go figure out what's going on with a journal and, you know, diving into scriptures and maybe a good book. Whatever it is that is a rhythm for you, I would have daily rhythms of spiritual disciplines, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, and then probably every five to ten years, which would probably be like an extended sabbatical. So daily, it's, you know what it is, time in the Word, time in prayer, you know, meditation, things like that. You know, weekly, it's maybe a little bit of a deeper dive with my wife around some things that are going on and things we pray for. Monthly, it might be an abiding day for me. That I'm just like, I just need a day. Uh, quarterly, it might be a, a long weekend with my wife. Uh, and we spend some time in the Word together there, but we're just having a good time, having fun. Um, you know, yearly, it might be a spiritual emphasis week in my home with my kids, which they hate, but I do um, sometimes. And, and they actually don't hate it. They just act like they hate it, but then later they always tell me lessons they've learned from. You know what I mean. You know what it's like. So those kinds of things. And remember, say no for the better Yes. It means asking God, what's most important in my life right now? Where have I violated biblical boundaries? And are there any place in my life where my priorities aren't in line with my, what I value most? Okay. 
take time to sharpen the saw, okay? Uh, that one guy's just sawing away forever, but his saw just gets dull, and he's just not cutting near as much wood. The other guy stops, sharpens his saw, takes a break, gets a drink, comes back, cuts twice as much wood. Reflect, seek counsel, build uh, a sense in your team that we need each other, that we know how to delegate. You don't delegate just by handing off. You delegate by handing off and then mentoring and supervising. But then you've built another leader. So practice self-care and healthy boundaries. Invest intentional time in personal and family life. This is the third indicator, stewarding your family and personal life well. Are you present when you're home? Are you consistent in the home and in public? Or are you a hypocrite at home in your families? Like, I wish you were a shepherd at home like you are at church. Wow, that hurts. But if instead of getting defensive and licking your wounds and saying you guys don't appreciate me, go, forgive me. Mind the gap, you know, I was in in uh, England, and I kept hearing that every time I went on the subway, and mind the gap, mind the gap. Mind the integ integrity gap. Where is my spoken theology ahead of my lived theology? Especially as it relates to my family who can see everything. Um, don't tune out if you're single or you're, this doesn't really apply to you. This is mainly for pastors and elders who are married, but... Um, Date your spouse. Talk, connect, pray, um, enjoy one another. Um, if you're single, you know, uh, go out with somebody who's life-giving and just share what's going on in your life and vice versa. Blend your family and ministry in a way that your family enjoys doing ministry with you at times doesn't mean they're always being forced to go do stuff. It means they're enjoying it. Disciple at home at least as well as you are at church. Deuteronomy 4.9 comes to mind there. EQ and CQ, number four. Uh, emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. Grow your self-awareness and learn to read people better which means, God, give me more compassion and more discernment. More compassion and more discernment. You know, in love, give me more compassion and more discernment. Chemistry matters. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay? So, in emotional intelligence, I'm telling you, it can be coached up. If you're like, I'm about as emotionally intelligent as a rock. Okay, then say, then I'm like, okay, but you're humble because you see it. Go get some coaching. My wife's tried to coach me. It just makes me mad. I get that. Find somebody else that maybe it doesn't feel quite as personal to coach you up, but tell your wife you're working on it, okay? Um, all right, number five. This is another obvious one, but leader competence doesn't just happen, okay? Gain skills in leadership and management, our last one. Some of us can lead pretty well, but we don't manage people very well. Some of us manage people pretty well, but we need a number one that kind of has vision and can lead, right? I, I'm, I'm a big believer. If, if I were running a church planning movement, I'd send people out in twos. I just would. Um, if it's a little un, un, pra, impractical, but I would do it. Because there's, it's hard to find... Right, guys? It's hard to find someone that's the full package. Right? But I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty strong leader. I'm not a great manager. So I know that. So I put managers around me, right? That, you got to be able to do that. But grow in both of them. I got to know at least enough about management to know a good manager when I see them. Right? But I don't have to be the best manager in the church. In my case, because of what I do, it's not as, I, you know, I'm more of a shepherd, so it isn't quite the deficit it would be for some of you. Think servant leader, though, not cowboy. Shepherd, not cowboy leadership. As leaders, we need to gain skill 
but only as it lines up with Scripture. You can read all the leadership books out there, and I don't have a problem with you reading some secular leadership books. I'm reading one right now in coaching, and it's really helpful. But I line it up against Scripture and say, is there anything about this that is going to take us, is, is going to mess up the power dynamic, the control dynamic? You know what I'm talking about. Just what Dave Harvey was talking about. I've seen that abused. I've seen spiritual abuse in the church. I will never tolerate it again. I will never be a part of a church with it again. And I would strongly encourage you to call it out or get away from it if it's going on in your church. Or repent of it if it's you. Okay? So, um, I'm reading a lot about leadership, but mainly I'm looking at it through Scripture or godly men who have written on it. Um, did I mention that it might be helpful to get a coach, a leadership coach? How many of you have a coach, somebody in your life that's really mentoring you in leadership? Yeah, like probably a tenth of the audience or so. It, wouldn't it be great if it was 90% of us? Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was more of that going on? Um, you need a plan. You need a, you need a path that's in line with Scripture. Okay, so... Pursuing a coach and meeting with them regularly to, to develop your spiritual, emotional, and relational health would be a phenomenal thing to do. And if you can't think of who right now, maybe it's somebody in your church, maybe it's somebody outside your church, or maybe it's a, a somebody that does it for a living, um, you just have to find the right fit for you. Okay, but develop a plan. If you walked out of here today a bit convicted, about some things, a bit excited about other things you're doing well, and with some sense of clarity, I've got to write some more things down. That would be a, that'd be a win, okay? Because we talked about ongoing spiritual growth, self-care, stewardship of family and personal life, growing EQ and CQ, and then growing leadership and management skills. And I've developed a, a beta test through the GCC. It's not Final, it still needs a little bit of tweaking. But it's uh, a, a number of questions in each of those five categories where you, if you take that online, will give you a sense of where you stand in each area. Okay? Uh, it's a little more objective than you just trying to guess spitball it in here. Um, if you want to take that, there's going to be a URL, a website uh, address here coming up. You can, it's called a le it's the Leadership Health Assessment. Um, it, for the next 30 days, you can take it for no charge at all. And it, here's the conditions. You got to be willing to take a quick survey when we get that out and tell us what you thought of it, what, could, what we could improve, what was helpful. Okay, just in even the way it was, it was set up. Uh, there's going to be an a instruction sheet. An FAQ, if you want to read it, just some questions that have already come up about it so you understand better how to take it and how to use it, and then the questions themselves. Then that's going to get sent to us automatically when you're done. Within two to four weeks, because we're going to have several of them, we'll get you some results. You'll be either in a low, moderate, or high leadership health in each of the five categories, and we'll tell you what the implications and what the beginning of a plan could be to address that area. Okay, we'll have, and so, what, what are the conditions? You'll fill out a survey later. You'll, you'll be patient with this as we do it, and you realize it's not, a, it's not the, the final thing. So that would be helpful. Um, again, you can, um, I think the URL's right there. You, I think it's in your notes, too. Feel free, you know, to, to, you can get online and take that any time in the next 30 days. And uh, again, we'll get it back to you within two to four weeks after you've submitted it with some recommendations. Um, I will say, as, as busy as I am trying to care for a hundred and some leaders, I don't have time to coach you unless you're a GCC pastor who would want to get a one-off kind of time with me. But I might be able to help you get some resources to, to get some of that done, okay? Um, so I just want to encourage you guys, um, healthy Leadership really matters to the GCC. Hopefully it really matters to you. And you can't be part of a healthy plurality unless you work on you, right? You can't be looking at the other guy getting healthy. You got to look at you getting healthy. Does that make sense? All right, let me pray. Father, thank you so much.
for the time with these folks today and just talking about some really important things. We are serious, Lord, about pursuing you and Christ's likeness, and we know Christ is the ultimate goal for health. He was full of all the fruits of the Spirit. He was full of grace and truth. We want to be more like him, and we know there's areas we need to grow in terms of the way we um, uh, follow you and lead others. So help us to do that, Um, even to take some time in the next week to take some of these notes and think, where do I need to grow most? Where am I doing well that I could teach or help or mentor others? Lord, help these uh, folks to do that so that this is not just a set of notes, but even begins to shape the way they lead going forward. Thanks so much, Lord, for your grace. In Christ's name, amen.